Section twelve of Confessions of an English Opium Eater. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Geeson. Confessions of an English Opium Eater by Thomas de Quincey. Section twelve as when some great painter dips his pencil in the gloom of earthquake and eclipse shelley's revolt of islam reader who have thus far accompanied me i must request your attention to a brief explanatory note on three points one for several reasons i have not been able to compose the notes for this part of my narrative into any regular and connected shape i give the notes disjointed as i find them or have now drawn them up from memory some of them point to their own date some i have dated and some are undated whenever it could answer my purpose to transplant them from the natural or chronological order i have not scrupled to do so sometimes i speak in the present sometimes in the past tense few of the notes perhaps were written exactly at the period of time to which they relate but this can little affect their accuracy as the impressions were such that they can never fade from my mind much has been omitted i could not without effort constrain myself to the task of either recalling or constructing into a regular narrative the whole burthen of horrors which lies upon my brain this feeling partly i plead in excuse and partly that i am now in london and am a helpless sort of person and cannot even arrange his own papers without assistance and i am separated from the hands which are wont to perform for me the offices of an amanuensis two you will think perhaps that i am too confidential and communicative of my own private history it may be so but my way of writing is rather to think aloud and follow my own humours than much to consider who is listening to me and if i stop to consider what is proper to be said to this or that person i shall soon come to doubt whether any part at all is proper the fact is i place myself at a distance of fifteen or twenty years ahead of this time and suppose myself writing to those who will be interested about me hereafter and wishing to have some record of time the entire history of which no one can know but myself i do it as fully as i am able with the efforts i am now capable of making because i know not whether i can ever find time to do it again three it will occur to you often to ask why did i not release myself from the horrors of opium by leaving it off or diminishing it to this i must answer briefly it might be supposed that i yielded to the fascinations of opium too easily it cannot be supposed that any man can be charmed by its terrors the reader may be sure therefore that i made attempts innumerable to reduce the quantity i add that those who witnessed the agonies of those attempts and not myself were the first to beg me to desist but could not have i reduced it a drop a day or by adding water have bisected or trisected a drop a thousand drops bisected would thus have taken nearly six years to reduce and that would certainly not have answered but this is a common mistake of those who know nothing of opium experimentally i appeal to those who do 
whether it is not always found that down to a certain point it can be reduced with ease and even with pleasure but that after that point further reduction causes intense suffering yes say many thoughtless persons who know not what they are talking of you will suffer a little low spirits and dejection for a few days i answer no there is nothing like low spirits on the contrary the mere animal spirits are uncommonly raised the pulse is improved the health is better it is not there that the suffering lies it has no resemblance to the sufferings caused by renouncing wine it is a state of unutterable irritation of stomach which surely is not much like dejection accompanied by intense perspirations and feelings such as i shall not attempt to describe without more space at my command i shall now enter in medias res and shall anticipate from a time when my opium pains might be said to be at their acme an account of their palsying effects on the intellectual faculties my studies have now been long interrupted i cannot read to myself with any pleasure hardly with a moment's endurance yet i read aloud sometimes for the pleasure of others because reading is an accomplishment of mine and in the slang use of the word accomplishment as a superficial and ornamental attainment almost the only one i possess and formerly if i had any vanity at all connected with any endowment or attainment of mine it was with this for i had observed that no accomplishment was so rare players are the worst readers of all mm, reads vilely and mrs who is so celebrated can read nothing well but dramatic compositions milton she cannot read sufferably people in general either read poetry without any passion at all or else overstep the modesty of nature and read not like scholars of late if i have felt moved by anything it has been by the grand lamentations of samson agonistes or the great harmonies of the satanic speeches in paradise regained when read aloud by myself a young lady sometimes comes and drinks tea with us at her request and m s i now and then read w s poems to them w by the by is the only poet i ever met who could read his own verses often indeed he reads admirably for nearly two years i believe that i read no book but one and i owe it to the author in discharge of a great debt of gratitude to mention what that was the sublimer and more passionate poets i still read as i have said by snatches and occasionally but my proper vocation as i well know was the exercise of the analytic understanding now for the most part analytic studies are continuous and not to be pursued by fits and starts or fragmentary efforts mathematics for instance intellectual philosophy etc were all become insupportable to me i shrunk from them with a sense of powerless and infantine feebleness that gave me an anguish the greater from remembering the time when i grappled with them to my own hourly delight and for this further reason because i had devoted the labour of my whole life and had dedicated my intellect blossoms and fruits to the slow and elaborate toil of constructing one single work to which i had presumed to give the title of an unfinished work of spinoza's viz 
de emendatione umani intellectus this was now lying locked up as by frost like any spanish bridge or aqueduct begun upon too great a scale for the resources of the architect and instead of reviving me as a monument of wishes at least and aspirations and a life of labour dedicated to the exaltation of human nature in that way in which god had best fitted me to promote so great an object it was likely to stand a memorial to my children of hopes defeated of baffled efforts of materials uselessly accumulated of foundations laid that were never to support a superstructure of the grief and the ruin of the architect in this state of imbecility i had for amusement turned my attention to political economy my understanding which formerly had been as active and restless as a hyena could not i suppose so long as i lived at all sink into utter lethargy and political economy offers this advantage to a person in my state that though it is eminently an organic science no part that is to say but what acts on the whole as the whole again reacts on each part yet the several parts may be detached and contemplated singly great as was the prostration of my powers at this time yet i could not forget my knowledge and my understanding had been for too many years intimate with severe thinkers with logic and the great masters of knowledge not to be aware of the utter feebleness of the main herd of modern economists i had been led in eighteen hundred and eleven to look into loads of books and pamphlets on many branches of economy and at my desire m sometimes read to me chapters from more recent works or parts of parliamentary debates i saw that these were generally the very dregs and rinsings of the human intellect and that any man of sound head and practised in wielding logic with a scholastic adroitness might take up the whole academy of modern economists and throttle them between heaven and earth with his finger and thumb or bray their fungus heads to powder with a lady's fan at length in eighteen hundred and nineteen a friend in edinburgh sent me down mr ricardo's book and recurring to my own prophetic anticipation of the advent of some legislator for this science i said before i had finished the first chapter thou art the man wonder and curiosity were emotions that had long been dead in me yet i wondered once more i wondered at myself that i could once again be stimulated to the effort of reading and much more i wondered at the book had this profound work been really written in england during the nineteenth century was it possible i supposed thinking had been extinct in england could it be that an englishman and he not in academic bowers but oppressed by mercantile and senatorial cares had accomplished what all the universities of europe and a century of thought had failed even to advance by one hair's breadth all other writers had been crushed and overlaid by the enormous weight of facts and documents mr ricardo had deduced a priori from the understanding itself laws which first gave a ray of light into the unwieldy chaos of materials and had constructed what had been but a collection of tentative discussions into a science of regular proportions now first standing on an eternal basis 
thus did one single work of a profound understanding avail to give me a pleasure and an activity which i had not known for years it roused me even to write or at least to dictate what m wrote for me it seemed to me that some important truths had escaped even the inevitable eye of mr ricardo and as these were for the most part of such a nature that i could express or illustrate them more briefly and elegantly by algebraic symbols than in the usual clumsy and loitering diction of economists the whole would not have filled a pocket-book and being so brief with m for my amanuensis even at this time incapable as i was of all general exertion i drew up my prolegomena to all future systems of political economy i hope it will not be found redolent of opium though indeed to most people the subject is a sufficient opiate this exertion however was but a temporary flash as the sequel showed for i designed to publish my work arrangements were made at a provincial press about eighteen miles distant for printing it an additional compositor was retained for some days on this account the work was even twice advertised and i was in a manner pledged to the fulfilment of my intention but i had a preface to write and a dedication which i wished to make a splendid one to mr ricardo i found myself quite unable to accomplish all this the arrangements were countermanded the compositor dismissed and my prolegomena rested peacefully by the side of its elder and more dignified brother End of section twelve. Recording by Martin Geeson in Hazelmere, Surrey.